In this video, I will be performing a suite in C minor by Johann Jakob Froberger. For reference, this suite is usually given the number 19. Uh, this number is based on the edition of Froberger's works that was published by Guido Adler in the early 20th century. This edition still exists and one can play from it. What I would say is that you have to be careful in the sense that uh, Guido Adler actually switched some of the movements around in Froberger suites to make them conform to our modern standard. In other words, the suites are usually arranged as Almond, Courant, Sarabande and Gig. And as you will see in this particular suite, for instance, the order of movements is Almond, Gig, Courant and Sarabande. There are two aspects of the performance that I would like to mention. And before I get into that, let me just say that I am sitting in front of the spinet simply because I want to demonstrate something. The performance is actually going to be on the harpsichord. So the first aspect has to do with the edition that I'm using. This is the Baron Reiter edition that was edited by Siegbert Rampe. And the reason I'm using this edition is because it is based on a fairly newly discovered manuscript of 14 of Froberger suites that we usually refer to as the Buliowski manuscript because it was copied by Michael Buliowski in 1675. The importance of this manuscript lies in the fact that, first of all, it's the earliest source that we have for some of these suites, since most of them don't actually exist in any of Froberger's manuscripts. They exist from copies that were made later. So this is the earliest source that we have for some of these suites. And also it was copied in Strasbourg, which was fairly close to where Froberger was working. Now, um, in this manuscript, some of the movements that we have are new, so we do have some movements that do not exist in any other source. The C minor suite does exist in other sources, but as I said, this is the earliest source for all of these suites that we have. And another very important uh, factor here is the fact that at the end of this particular suite, we find the indication Froberger ex autografo, meaning that for this suite and for a couple of others in this manuscript, it seems that Buliowski may have been working directly from a now lost Froberger autograph. Now, what does this change? In general, I would say what it changes in the suite is that there are certain changes in notes, so certain A-flats may be A-naturals and vice versa. Uh, there are certain rhythmic details that are a little different. I would say the biggest difference comes near the end of the jig, three measures before the end, where there is a fairly complex passage of 32nd and 16th notes. There is the, an indication, avec discrétion, lentement, or translated with discretion, slowly, meaning that at that point in time, we have to slow down a little bit. Um, you will notice that most recordings that exist of this piece actually don't do this. And the reason is that as far as I know, the Rampe edition is the only one that is based on the Buliowski manuscript. So every other edition was prepared before that and therefore that indication is simply not there. The other aspect of this performance has to do with the tuning and what I have chosen to use is quarter comma mean tone and I would say this requires a little bit of an explanation. I don't think you will find many performances of this piece using quarter comma mean tone and I'm not claiming that this is the only way to go, but I wanted to offer my rationale for using quarter comma mean tone in this instance. 
Now, as I've mentioned in previous videos, I'm doing a, a quick recap here. Uh, quarter comma mean tone is based on having eight pure major thirds. So that is one of its advantages that we have this, this very beautiful um, pure major third. which if you're used to um, equal tempered thirds, this may sound a little bit narrower. Equally tempered thirds are wider than pure, uh, actually much wider. Um, the other nice thing about uh, mean tone is that because we have these, these um, pure thirds and because other intervals are adjusted in different ways, I'll get to this in a moment, um, half steps are not equidistant, so you get a very, very spicy chromatic scale. And now let's talk a little bit about what, at least for us, can be considered disadvantages. When you concentrate so much on having so many pure major thirds, that means that something else has to be adjusted in different ways. And one thing we have to do is narrow the fifths. So the fifths are slightly narrower than what we're used to in equal temperament. However, that's not the problem. The problem is uh, with one particular fifth that is in between A flat and E flat, which sounds something like this. We call this the Wolf Fifth. I don't need to explain why you can hear it. And what it is really is that this is not a fifth at all. It's actually a diminished sixth because what we have here is not A flat to E flat, but as a matter of fact, a G sharp to E flat. One thing that one has to keep in mind here that's not what we're used to, the way we're used to thinking about this, is that you don't have enharmonic keys in uh, mean tone, in quarter comma mean tone. So the black keys, what here are white keys, actually have one particular function and only one. So we have G sharp, but not A flat, and we have E flat, but not D sharp. And the same is true for the other ones as well. Um, so that's one thing. And the other, the other problem is that, of course, as I said, this is a diminished sixth because we have G sharp to E flat. However, this also means that the major third between A flat and C is not a major third at all, but actually a diminished fourth. So very wide. So in um, what we sacrifice, let's say, for these eight pure major thirds is, first of all, we have this, this wolf fifth, but we also have four wide thirds. So the, the eight major thirds are pure, the remaining four are very wide. So what this means is that there are certain limitations in um, quarter comma mean tone, meaning that there are certain keys that sound very, very much out of tune or very dissonant. They have very dissonant intervals. And in many respects, one could say that there are certain keys that don't exist at all. For instance, if I don't have A flat, um, I don't have a key such as A flat major or A flat minor. Um, these keys simply don't exist at all. So this seems a limitation to us. However, what I have mentioned before in previous videos is that what happens is that we can use these limitations if we, if we know about them, and composers in the 17th century knew about them, you can use these limitation for expressive purposes. Do you want to talk about despair or something a little unpleasant? Well, start going towards those areas that create these intervals that are 
out of whack, so to speak. And suddenly we can all tell that this is about something unpleasant. And this is indeed something that we have really lost with equal temperament, the fact that temperament can be a source of expression in music. We can express different feelings, different emotions, depending on the temperament that we're using and depending on how we use a particular temperament. How does this affect this suite by Froberger? Well, uh, one could say that the problem with this suite is that is in C minor, meaning that if you think about the key signature of C minor, we have B flat, E flat, and A flat. In other words, the Wolf fifth is part of the key signature of C minor. So what do we do now? Because it's one thing to say that a composer is going to use these um, so-called spicy, out-of-whack areas for uh, expressive purposes. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to say, okay, well, what happens when we have a piece that's written in a key that actually has a wolf fifth in it? Shouldn't we try to change it a little bit? And in many respects, if you look back to the 17th century and we kind of generalize a little bit and see how temperament progressed, shall we say, from the 17th century to the 18th century, as composers wanted to explore some of these more forbidden areas without the limitations of them sounding always a little unpleasant, uh, we start seeing composers and musicians in general trying to modify um, mean tone a little bit, try to spread the wool fifth a little bit so that, for example, you don't have as many pure major thirds, but you also don't have a wool fifth anymore, and you also don't have those other very wide thirds that I mentioned. Um, and I would say in many respects, many recordings of this piece and, and of other pieces that are in such more questionable keys, shall we say, um, they modify things a little bit. So why don't we change, why don't we temper quarter comma mean tone a little more and make it a little more pleasant? Now, as I mentioned before, I cannot say that what I'm doing is the correct solution. However, one thing I would like to mention is that I don't see the reason why we always have to make sure that everything is pleasant. What if the composer didn't want to have something pleasant? And what if they really wanted this? So I don't think that every time we find a piece that is using a key like C minor, for instance, I don't think the first thing to do is to say, okay, this has a wolf fifth, let's change it around. I think it's more important to see how does the a composer use this particular key. Now, um, if you play 18th century music, it's very clear that composers are not thinking in this way. So if, um, I don't know, if you look at Bach's second um, French suite in uh, C minor, let me, See if I can remember how this one goes. It's not working. I mean, we have A flats and E flats used indiscriminately right from the very beginning. And, and it's very clear that Bach is not thinking this way. However, one thing that I mentioned in the previous videos that I made with Lebeg's suite in D minor is to say that um, 17th century composers are not thinking of tonality in the same ways that we do. It's a very complicated subject and it would require a totally different video devoted to it. Uh, however, it's, one can say that they're simply not thinking with the same kinds of accidentals that we are right now. Um, it has to do a lot with the fact that they're still thinking in terms of hexachords that were taken from, from Renaissance music theory. And what I mean by this is that, like I mentioned with the Lebeg piece, we look at um, 17th century music pieces 
and they are in a particular key. This particular key we associate with a particular key signature. We look at the beginning of the piece and yet this key signature is not what we expect. It may be missing one or two accidentals. So with the Lebeg suite in D minor that I had posted previously, uh, we, have a key, uh, we have a piece in D minor. We expect a key signature of B flat and yet there is no B flat in the key signature. There is no accidental at all. And Lebeg is playing with this uh, B flat, B natural ambiguity. Similarly, if we look at the key signature of this Froberger suite, it's in C minor. What we expect is B flat, E flat, and A flat. However, when we look at the key signature of this suite, the only accidental that's there is B flat. We don't have A flat or E flat as an accidental. Now, have no fear. If you look at the piece, you will find that the E flat is written in. So for every time we have the pitch E, for the most part, we do indeed have E flats. They're just written in and not part of the key signature. This is not the case though with A flat. And similarly to the Lebeg suite with the B flat, B natural ambiguity, here we have the same type of ambiguity with A flat and A natural. So what happens is that unlike the Bach example that I played, where Bach is clearly using A flats, and not only is he using A flats, but he's pitting them against E flat, so creating this, this wolf um, effect. What we have here in the Froberger is that we cannot assume that every time we see the pitch A, it's going to be accompanied by a flat. As a matter of fact, I would say that perhaps there are more A naturals than A flats throughout this piece. So we're dealing with this kind of fluid tonal ambiguity in this piece. And what this means is that, again, unlike the way Bach is thinking in terms of tonality, what Froberger is doing here is he is saving the A flat for moments of heightened expression. So what happens is that what you get in this piece, when you play it in quarter comma mean tone, is you don't get this, this kind of ugly dissonance, but what you actually get is this moments of extreme poignancy. And I would say when you get to the Saraband especially, there are moments that are truly heart-wrenching. And this kind of heightened expression can only be achieved, can only be heard, if we actually perform the piece in quarter comma mean tone. Now, does this mean that this is definitely what Froberger had in mind? This is not something that I can answer. Uh, I think everyone has to come to their own conclusions about this. What I would say is that what I find is that if I don't play this piece in quarter comma mean tone, I find that something is missing. And because of this reaction, I think, to me at least, it makes sense to play it in quarter comma mean tone. It's convincing. Um, if you asked me the same question with a Bach piece, I would say no. Uh, my first reaction, if I'm playing the, the French suite, the C minor French suite, and the instrument is tuned to quarter comma mean tone, my first reaction would be, okay, uh, let's stop for a minute, let me tune the instrument to something milder. Um, but when it comes to Froberger, I really miss all of this heightened expression unless I'm playing the piece in quarter comma mean tone. Incidentally, one more thing I wanted to mention here is that the score that you will see that accompanies the recording is the Bulyovsky manuscript. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.